Good evening and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. My name is Farah Asif and I'm founder and president of Institute of Peace and Diplomatic Studies. On behalf of the Institute, which is located in Pakistan and Puri International Institute at San Francis Javier's University in Canada, um, I'm welcoming all of you to this inclusive episode of Global Woman Insight. Uh, Global Woman Insight, ladies and gentlemen, I have started recently as a conversation, as a digital conversation with extraordinary women from across the world, and especially uh, dealing with their, you know, leadership, putting spotlight on the leadership and pressing issues faced by the women uh, in the contemporary world. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, IPDS is a non-for-profit think tank, aims to provide to global peace by focusing on innovative, groundbreaking uh, action research, effective advocacy, dialogue series in the thematic areas, sustainable development, diplomatic studies, public diplomacy, leadership in communication, and focusing on women, peace, and leadership. At the Institute, we have established Center for Women, Peace, and Leadership, an academic and training center for excellence inaugurated by the Nobel laureate, Mrs. is Tawakkul Abdul Salam Karman from Yemen. I'm honored that tonight our guest is Excellency Ambassador Sawani Hunt, founder of Harvard's Women and Public Policy Program and Chair in Inclusive Security. I'm also joined by today by my co-host and my mentor, Eileen Alma, who is the Director of International Center for Women Leadership at Cody Institute. Thank you very much, Mar Farhat, and Eileen. greetings to everyone. Hi, Eileen. Greetings. Hi, and thank you for joining us. And Cody Institute is delighted to support this event alongside Institute of Peace and Diplomatic Studies um, uh, with Farhat. And for 60 years, Cody Institute has been working alongside citizen leaders around the world who seek to advance community-driven development and social change. And in recognition of its continuing commitment and strategic focus on advancing women's social and political and economic empowerment, Cody Institute launched the International Center for Women's Leadership in 2011. Nearly a decade later, we are so proud to have supported more than 1,200 women leaders globally like Farhat, and that number continues to grow exponentially. That similar commitment to women's leadership is exemplified by the work of our special guest today, Ambassador Swanee Hunt. She is the Eleanor Roosevelt Lecturer in Public Policy and the founder of the Women in Public Policy Program at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. She chairs the Washington-based uh, Institute of Inclusive Security, um, whose bold goal is to transform decision-making about war and peace. She, uh, it, it, through government consultation, research, leadership development and advocacy, inclusive security increases participation of all stakeholders, um, particularly women in preventing, resolving, and rebuilding. Thank you so much, Eileen. Yeah. Uh, and so I will just say that also, Ambassador Hunt has founded Hunt Alternatives, which operates out of Washington, DC, and is combating the de demand for illegal purchase sex, including trafficking in the US. Um, she's supporting the seismic shift, the incredibly important shift of elevating US women in highest elected positions promoting scores of leaders of domestic social movements and bolstering women's leadership in conflict regions. Um, she is a widely pub published researcher, columnist, and guest commentator. We're gonna hear about one of her books a little bit later on that she's just recently published um, with Duke University Press. She's a mother, she's a grandmother, and uh, we are just extremely delighted to have her with us today. Farhat. Thank you so much, Eileen, for this amazing uh, introduction. Ambassador, just to begin with, um, you have written and spoken a lot about your leadership experiences. What is your own leadership philosophy and what are some of the standout moments of your journey that have been pivotal throughout this you know, journey? Yeah, thank you. First, I'm really, really glad to be here. I was so pleased when I received this invitation. and. I wish I could see the faces of every single person who is uh, on this um, on this call. But uh, you know, I was born in a very, very conservative um, part of the, of, I guess, the world, but certainly of the United States. So um, if we were raised, for example, it was a Southern Baptist, a very Christian 
but conservative Christian home. And so I was constantly hearing about God as he, 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 he. And it was hard for me to figure out where I really fit in. Or it was Jesus as Lord, he, 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 or the Holy Spirit. I mean, and so I, and I was very, very religious. So that took a lot of thinking and praying and, and soul searching. I spent eight years in a theological seminary and that helped a lot because I began to integrate the idea of actually God as female and how does that all come together? But it was, it was so conservative that um, in terms of American uh, standards, I had this moment where I went to a club, a professional club, and it was related to oil and gas, which is my, my family background. So I'm standing there and I'm, I can say, I see um, there's a table over here. And I say, that's my table. And that, there's a tall man in a, a red coat. Okay. And he said, well, I have a table over here. Um, and, you know, it's a beautiful view by the window. You see, with the name Swanee, my, my guests may not know. It's, it's, no one has that name. It's completely unusual. So people couldn't tell if I was a man or a woman. So that's why they reserved a table in the main dining room. So I go back and forth with this nice guy. And, you know, well, you know, I, I see my table is already reserved over in the main dining room. Oh, but, you know, we have this beautiful one in the ladies dining room. And I, well, you know, actually, I want to be in the main. And finally, he says to me, um, Mrs. Hunt, I can take you to that table, but it's going to cost me my job. That was a key, a key moment for me that I had more in common with this African American man than I did with the white man who was the vice president of the company who was standing next to me. Because the African American man also could not sit in the main dining room. So that really turned the social order on its head for me. And as a woman, then I had to think, wait a minute, where do I fit in here? And that's why I married the right man. I mean, the second time, you know, some people say, you know, I don't love men or I hate men. I have to tell you, I have loved far too many men in my life. So I'm not a man hater. So anyway, always marry your second husband first. That's the way it works. So I married my second husband, who was this big cheerleader for me. And he's the one who said, you should be an ambassador. You know, Hillary Clinton and President Clinton is, Bill Clinton's going to be president. No one expected that, including me. I didn't vote for him. I voted for Hillary, even though she wasn't running, right? But I voted because of her. And, and so she wanted to have women in the administration. And she would talk about the sexism in a very interesting way. I, I, I'm sorry if I'm going on too long. I'm telling stories, but okay. So she said that when she was interviewing someone for a job and there was a man and a woman and she would offer this job to the man and it's a promotion, more money, more responsibility. Okay, Bill, here's the job, more money, more, more responsibility. And he would say, great, when do I start? He would ask, instead of Bill, he would ask Barbara, that's a female name. And same conversation, you know, more responsibility, more money. And she says, do you really think I can do it? She said, a man never said, do you really think I can do it? And those stories, they really summarize what it's like to be a woman. And for the men on this call, I hope you hear about men's roles, that it was Charles who actually pushed me, pushed me forward constantly. You can do it. I said, no, I don't really. Yes, you can. You can. I know you can. Just like the women that Hillary Clinton had been interviewing for a promotion. So take that to heart, that often, guys, often, it takes an intervention from a man to help a woman be all she can be. 
that's Thank that's you, i mean i mean it's amazing um as you've been sharing that those men were very important in your life and they have also impacted you of course throughout your journey um we will be interested to know that how important it is to have mentors as as coaches and how essential it is to have mentors in in progressing throughout the leadership and what should be a rising leader should be looking for i mean throughout this journey when you are when you are you know you are a firefly you just beginning to grow into someone as like yourself for instance right um, thank well first of all thank you thank you for that but it, you're right it it is we would say it's a marathon not a sprint it's a long 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 26 mile run and it's not about how fast you're going it's how much endurance you have and there are a lot of women who go up and they peak at about 26 and it's just you know that's it and there are other women who go and they go they get to 26 uh, miles maybe 8 10 years later than the first ones but it's steady and they keep going and they keep going and they keep going One of my mentors was Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. She doesn't know that. Uh, another one was, uh, and she became, of course, the first woman elected um, of a state in Africa. Another one was Eleanor Roosevelt in the United States. The Roosevelt name is very well known um, internationally. And we had two great presidents who were Roosevelts. but she became after her husband died she became our ambassador to the united nations and she's the one who carried forward the the resolution on human rights and she always felt very very inferior she was not attractive visually her husband had affairs with other women she had a, a really hard time and she kept rising above it and one of my favorite sayings of hers is you must do the things you think you cannot and if you wake up every morning and say what is it i think i can't do and you turn that around and you say i am going to do something that last night before i went to sleep i thought i couldn't do and this morning i've decided i'm going to do it i mean a lot of this is in your head because your heart may be telling you i can't do it i can't do it i can't do it so you got to get into your head at that point and say hell's bells yes i will take this on yes thank you so much because this is the similar kind of journey that we all been passing through and many of the participants they might be you know hearing from your experience so you are an influential feminist voice in variety of the media outlets as well and elevating and advocating a lot of women voices that need to be heard how have you built your own capacity in navigating through media spaces because oh. you know and how as the there are opportunities there are challenges and how you put yourself through all this i mean especially yeah, through know, media yeah yeah you know that's so interesting because i've never been asked that and i've never really stepped back and thought about that well one thing you know how we hire someone who will uh help us with the political world and you know keep us up to date or or we hire someone who will help us in terms of how do we manage the whole family thing with our career etc one of the people i hired was a person who would say okay here are media opportunities that women have not taken advantage of you know here are the ones where women have dominated here are the ones where women are a you know relatively frequent voice but not dominating and then here are the ones that basically have no women and they're really really important and you know it would take 4 years 5 years of building that relationship with the person going to the publisher or the editor saying hi i i'm swanny hunt i have a piece on rwanda and he would say well you know i'll call you uh if we 
to think that we're going to cover Rwanda. Well, the call never comes. So then I go back and I say, hi there. You know, I've been doing some work on Pakistan and India, and I have a piece that I would like to have published in yours. And he would say, well, I'll call you back if we you know, develop an interest in it. I mean, over and over and over and over again. I've written four books and I would go to publisher after publisher after publisher and then bingo. The fifth one would say, sure. And it would become part of curriculum all over the world. Um, and so it, it has that, that sense of going back and going back and going back and not ever expecting the first time or the fourth time or the sixth time to be successful. A lot of this is a, I don't want to say it's a waiting game because, because that implies that you are doing something and then you're, then you're waiting for it. It's really a matter of repetition. We would say it's a numbers game. You just, how many times have you tried uh, to get something, a story placed? Oh, only 47? Well, here, you know, you're ready for a win now, you know, you're ready for 48 and you just, and you got to have people around you who, who are telling you the ter terrible stories that they went through and then they won all kinds of awards for the book they finally got published. You just keep, keep some of those people around you. Read, read about their stories where they tell how hard it was. Thank you so much for, especially this global woman inside conversation is also making spaces amongst uh, finding a place, you know, and spotlighting uh, woman leaders like yourself and many others who are, who are just join us today as well. So, Soani, um, you have written in the media over the past many years and you've written about prominent women as well who are, who are standing out and you have written recently about continuing barriers to women's leadership and full participation in the political sphere as well. What do you feel are some of the contemporary issues we face, for example, whether it's the United States with elections or upcoming or in serious leadership positions that we are facing right now in pandemic and whatnot. So it's, yeah. it's all, yeah. yeah. Can, can you imagine being uh, an American woman and having a flagrant misogynist as the president who won in a dirty way over one of the great feminist leaders we've always had. But he, so here's how I can live with it because I, I cried for six months. So here's how I can look, look at it. The change, it never ever happens in a straight line. We think of it looking back, you know, let's call it uh, racial inequality, you know, or let's call it economic development. And we have gone from here to here. But we didn't go in that line. We started up and then we went down and then we came back up and we went down. And then, you know, it's, it's up and down. It's very jagged, like a saw. And that is where we are right now. We're at one of the lowest points that we have been in a long time. But you know what? Before Donald Trump, we had Barack Obama. And we will never have not had Barack Obama. Barack Obama was, a, uh, he was, um, he created a standard that, that we must live up to now. And we don't have to keep think, thinking about Donald Trump as being America. He doesn't represent the majority of Americans. He didn't win the majority of the votes, as you know. And that's because of, we have this screwy electoral college system, but he, Hillary Clinton won 3 million more votes than he did. And, you know, we just had to take a big gulp, a big, you know, gulp of air, knowing the horrible damage he would do worldwide. And also the, the uh, flagrant misogynist that he would encourage worldwide. And that's a big part of the tragedy here. So, for me to keep my eyes on, we say, keep your eyes on the prize. So keep my eyes on what are the values I believe in, work like the devil at the next election and before working right now to have him, Donald Trump, replaced 
by someone whom I've known for 25 years, who is deeply committed to the feminist cause, Joe Biden. And, and believe, we just have to keep going. And I, I try never to believe in what we would call never, never land. In other words, something that is just some unrealistic something. But I do want to believe in something that is beyond what I think we can do, beyond. But that's different from being simply naive. Mm -hmm. Those are excellent interventions, Ambassador Hunt. And I've been following a little bit the chat as, we, as we've been talking. And I do want to just reflect quickly to participants that are on the line that we had over 500 people sign up for this, uh, this event today and representing 72 different countries. So we'll do our best to try to incorporate some of your feedback and your, your comments and questions in here. Um, Farhat, just as a follow on from, um, from the, that first section around leadership, women's leadership in particular, we've had you know, people ask about you know, the key ingredients to making sure that we can really uh, uh, support and, uh, and, and ensure that women are taking these spaces as leaders in private and public sectors and what are some of your thoughts on that. We've also had somebody ask about, and you know, these are questions that we grapple with every day in our classes as well. Some of the, you know, how we can creatively address stereotypes and gender identities that have been internalized by both men and women and that are barriers to, to women's leadership. So, you know, what are your thoughts on that Ambassador Hunt in terms of what you've seen as, as, um, as possible ways of, of, of breaking that down a little bit? Uh, let me, I want to tell you something that has happened. I'm going to go in reverse. Something that happened to me at Harvard, and I want to tell you something that happened in, in Vienna as it, when I was ambassador to Austria, and that was in the middle of a war, a genocide that we were trying to stop you know, in Bosnia, former Yugoslavia. So what happened at Harvard, imagine, so you're sitting at this big table, and they're all, almost all men around the table, and they're about 15. And these are the Harvard stars. And, you know, they've published a gazillion books. They probably average age um, 60, which doesn't seem so old now that I've just had my 70th birthday, but uh, it seemed, they were, all, they were old 60s, let me say. And, and so one of them says, okay, well, we're going to spend today thinking about the coming year. What is it that we are missing in our curriculum? And I thought, ooh, that's an opening. So I had with me resolutions from the UN, from the US Congress, from the uh, Organization of American States, from the African Union, et cetera all calling for the elevation of women to create stability. And they would lay it out, some were a paragraph, some were six pages. They just laid it out, laid out the argument. So I said, well, Dr., I'm gonna make it up, Dr. Smith, I'm glad you asked that question. And I have packets for everyone. I passed out the packets because I was ready for this. And it was like, it, it was like nothing had been said. I mean, there was no echo. And you know how deadly that is when there's no echo. And so the, the head of the meeting sat back in his chair. Now that's deadly. And then as I started talking, he picked up his hand and he looked at his watch. Holy cow. I would have said, holy shit, if I thought I could, but I can't. Holy cow. You know, he looks at his watch when I start speaking. I mean, come on. And so that's the kind of thing at Harvard I have faced. And there are superstars who back up what, what I'm working on. One is very, very famous internationally, Joseph Nye, because he wrote the book, Soft Power. And it's about, he's former assistant secretary of the, um, the Department of Defense. And um, he said, you know, you can go in with bombs and bullets. And that's what he calls hard power. He said, or you can be a country where other countries want to be like you. 
You know, it's, it's by example or it's persuasion. What do you think? Can we, do we have to start a war to have some solution here? You know, surely, you know, in hosting a, a negotiation, surely we can work together. We can find a way. And that's soft power. And he wrote a piece called When Women Lead. And there he lays out why when you elevate women, you will dramatically reduce war in the world. And this is coming from the person who was the dean of the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. The same, the same place where the head of that committee had looked at his watch when I started speaking. So, you know, you've got to understand that the territory is almost never one way or the other. Don't be discouraged by that. And if, if I may, um, be, I want to tell one other thing that is so important to women. And that is, um, if you'll allow me a very personal note, and that won't surprise you because women are very personal. And I know you'll allow me because it's like we've always been friends because that's how women are. We're very relational. I'm never talking about all women. I'm never talking about all men. But there is social science research that says that there are some significant differences. Okay. So I am sitting in a meeting in Vienna and I'm firing my number two, number three. By firing, I mean, I'm telling him he no longer has a job. He has to, he can no longer work for us. I am saying, you know, uh, he's the head of public affairs, in fact. And I said, you know, Steve, um, it's not working. And I think it's time for you to start looking for another place. It, you, it's just not a good fit here. And he says, oh, please, I, please, I really, I can do this. I can do this job. And I said, Steve, we've, we've worked out a whole work plan for you to improve. And, and look, let's, let's just be honest. And I'll write you a letter of recommendation, but, but let's be honest about this. Now, in comes Susan. And I have told Susan, my assistant, do not come in because I know what I'm going to have to do at this meeting. Make sure I get no phone calls. Make sure I have no interruptions. She walks in and she says, Ambassador Hunt. And I said, Susan, I'll talk to you in a few minutes. She said, Ambassador Hunt. And I said, Susan, not now. I mean, I'm thinking about Steve. Did I call him Steve? Anyway, my <laughs> my person. I made up a name, right? It's a real person. Okay, I all think. good. <laughs> okay, okay. So I'm thinking about Steve. And, and she hands me the note and it says, Lillian, my daughter, who is back in Denver, Colorado, uh, where her father lived. That's my first husband. Mm -hmm. It says Lillian has taken an overdose and they are, they are on their way to the hospital. They'll call you from the emergency room. Now, what am I going to do at that point? I sat down at the table and I said, Steve, it's really not working out. And I think we need to be honest about that. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll do what I can to help you find another position, but, you know, et cetera. Now, because look, I mean, what were my options? There wasn't anything I could do for Lillian in that moment. I could fall apart, but I had someone sitting there who was hearing some really devastating career news. And I decided to shift to him, not because I didn't love my daughter, okay? And so then I went out, Steve left, he was in tears. So I went out and I said to Susan, Susan, I want you to close these doors, don't come in, no one comes in. And I had a big desk that had a front to it. And so very big front and then there was a chair, a rolling chair that went around where I put my feet under the desk. And and so I pulled the chair back, the rolling chair, and I, Ambassador Hunt, 
I got under the desk. And I stayed there crying my eyes out. And, and I looked up and there were two pictures that I had. One was Hillary Clinton. And another one was a Russian poet, Anna Akhmatova, whose only son was put in a, in a political prison to keep her from writing her poetry because she was considered a voice of the people. And I thought, you know what? We have it hard. You know, we, we have it wonderfully as women, but we have it really, really hard at times when it's our family members who are paying the price. And I, I mean, my, my daughter Lillian might have said, you know, I'm paying the price because you're off being an ambassador. And, and that complicates it, sure. I mean, is that true? Yeah, kind of, you know? And I told her, you know, Lillian, I'm not a great mother, but I'm a really good mother. And really good has got to be good enough. Mm. And then later, I mean, later I could do no wrong. I mean, I was the best, she thought. This is when, I mean, I was the same person, right? I was the same mother. And, but she was telling me, oh, mom, now she was 26. Oh, mom, you were the best mom. You were a great mom. You are a great mom. And I said, Lillian, I am not a great mom, but I'm really good. And really good is good enough. Mm -hmm. So true. Because if I'm not going to take the blame, I don't get the credit. It's a man. It's a it's a mantra that we almost repeat on a daily basis, or we need to repeat as women that we are enough. Um, you could have your story. You know, you could have taken it right out of my brain, because you know, like you, you know, I've had these kinds of uh, these kinds of issues, and yeah. you know, the the under the underlying guilt we feel as women, especially as we're rising as leaders. Um, and trying to navigate all those spaces. And, you know, there's a, there's some wonderful women on the call who I consider mentors, um, you know, whether they know it or not, Senator Mobina Jaffer from our oh, Senate she's in Canada. Great. Senator Love Mary her. Coyle is on the call. You know, Senator Jaffer actually asked a question, which I think is, is the right question right now. And that is, you know, the work that you're doing um, and, you're, and you're doing it in particular, um, as we are, Farhad and I, of trying to rise women leaders, it's exhausting. So how do you keep up the energy? I mean, you've had a very storied career. How do you keep up that energy? What is it, um, what is it that you think that we as leaders should be taking away and, and thinking about um, even as we're na navigating that? You've partly answered it already, but if there's other thoughts that you have around that. I know two things. Um, and may I say, Mobina, you're a great friend of mine, and we haven't talked for a long time, but you can see how I smile when I think of you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I do two things. One of them is to be very quiet and to take some time, and I try to do it every day, and I, I manage about two days a week, to take some time, take out a journal, and write in my journal. But, you know, I have a journal for each one of my three kids. And so uh, depending on whom I'm really mad at, that's the person I write in his journal. And, you know, uh, and then the other thing I do is I climb mountains. I mean, literally, I climbed Kilimanjaro a few years ago. And I push, I just, it's like, what Eleanor Roosevelt said, and I, I have never considered myself an athlete, but I ran a marathon. And those are really important to me, and other people have their versions. It, it doesn't need to be any kind of motion with your legs. It could be singing. It could be some kind of, of wish that you've had. I don't think it's doing more work. I really don't. I mean, like, get, get that one out of your head. Mm -hmm. It's really to let yourself 
say, what am I passionate about that I'm not doing now? And I used to play the piano and I loved it. And I haven't taken out the music and played the piano for 25 years. I haven't had time. Well, that's of course not true. You have had time. We all have time for the things that keep us going, right? But maybe that's what you do. Maybe you spend three hours a week playing the piano. I feel like as I say these things, they may sound trite. And I, I'm just, I'm just telling you from my own experience. And, and, but also don't let your kids get you down. You know, I find, I, I try to find 10 minutes a year when all three of my kids like me at the same time, you know, and then I'm a success. And you just have to lower your expectations. That's for sure. I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and um, and talk to you a little bit about the organizations that you've you've you created or you've you know helped to establish. Um, and you know you've done it in so many different ways. You've done it um, in, in so many different sectors. So um, in academia um, at Harvard, one you know one most influential universities. Uh, in the world and uh, making sure that the women in public policy um, aspect was high on the agenda. And you've done it also in philanthropy. Um, you know, you put yourself on the line, your own, you understood your own privilege and you brought that to bear in, in the philanthropic world. And you've also done it in civil society, um, whether it's through organizations like Inclusive Security, or I think as, I think that was preceded with women waging peace as well. So I, there's, there's some things there that you've done um, and that you've had particular motivations around it. In this given time now, this, this changing time, um, you know, I, I'm really interested in, in how do we raise all women up, understanding homogeneity, it, you know, it doesn't exist among women, that some of us have a great deal more privilege than others. How are you ensuring now that women who are historically underrepresented in leadership spaces, in any of those those different sectors that you've been working, are are being, you know, look at are given the opportunities and are also being elevated. Whether it's indigenous women or you know women of color, persons of color, um, differently abled, or you know those that are um, identifying with the two spirited LGBTQ communities. So what what how has the the nature of your work changed, and, and how are the organizations responding to that? It's through the one sector that you didn't name, and that is the political. Because I had chaired for the governor um, in Colorado, I had chaired his work on housing, affordable housing, and homelessness, and had worked on a reform of the mental health system, which turned out to be successful. Okay, but what I knew is that Ronald Reagan like the year before, with the stroke of the pen, had wiped out 70% of the US budget for affordable housing. And when we say affordable housing, we mean housing for low income people. Now, if he could do that with, as I said, a stroke of a pen, like why was I spending my time you know, organizing coalitions from civil society, et cetera, et cetera, when, I, when he had so much power. And that's when I decided to go to the mayor, to go to the governor. That's how I ended up creating this coalition of, by coalition, I, the governor said, look, we don't have anything for housing and homelessness. You care about this. You keep bugging me about this. You've been in this office three times, five times. You just go and do it. And that's because I kept coming to his office over and over. And I have, I'm a real believer that one of the projects you didn't name is called, and you did at the beginning, Seismic Shift. And that's because after Hillary Clinton, I even have trouble saying lost because it was stolen. But anyway, after she became not, she didn't become president. Her thought and my thought and many other people's thoughts were there are so many women in this country and around the world who will be discouraged. And 
the number of women in the US Congress is going to go down. And instead, we had 40,000 women who were going to different organizations saying, I want to run for office. We had 40,000. And that's, that's a huge, huge number. And so it turned out to have an opposite effect. It was partly because we had what really echoed around the world, which is the Women's March. And I know there were versions of that and those were put together on the day of the inauguration. But Hillary Clinton took on as part of her job in life to encourage women to run. And I then, oh, look, I, I, I my role is minuscule, it's tiny, tiny, but I decided that I, my energy behind getting women to run for those higher offices. And I mean, I, I can write a check to some of them and I do, but that isn't nearly as important as they're receiving a letter, even with just a few lines with that ambassador uh, letterhead. And it says, Dear Susan, you didn't win the last, the last time, but run again. You know where all the money is in your state. People have gotten used to uh, having a woman. You have name recognition. You're smart. Run again. And trying to figure out how, like I, I signed, I don't know, hundreds of those and figuring out how to do things that um, may be what we call outside the box to get more and more and more women into the Congress. And now about 38, 40% of the Democrats in the Congress are women. And God bless them, the poor Republicans are only about 7% or 8%. And I say God bless them because you know, even though you know I'm an ardent Democrat, obviously, and not a Republican, still we need to have a two-party system. And the women, when they're in such a small minority, it's very hard for them to say, "Well, I disagree with this bill that my Republican colleagues are putting forward." I mean, to be that tiny voice in your party. And then you get thrown out and, you know, et cetera. Uh, they're in really bad shape. And I'd like to find a way to help them. So I go see them. And I say, listen, um, I'd like to work with you and, um, and make sure there are more women, Republican women who are running. You can mentor. And I want to be really clear. I'm never going to support you. I'm never going to support your campaign. In fact, I'll work against you. But I really want you to get more women in the Republican Party to run. You know, and I'm really honest. And they think, who is this woman? And then they say, gosh, you know, she's telling the truth. And all of that encouragement of people in the other party, I think, makes a very big difference because it's so unexpected. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um you know, I, um, I, I, we're obviously all watching what's going on in the U.S. right now with, you know, with bated breath, we're hoping for better outcomes, I think, ultimately on all sides. Um, in I'd like to shift, um, I think, to the, to the global nature. I'm hearing also in the comments um, that, you know, there's, uh, you know, a lot of uh, people that are interested in the work that you've been doing around peace and security, and particularly around women's leadership in those spaces. Um, and I, a couple of people have said, you know, they're obviously giving us some really good examples of what's going on in their countries, which I think we should try to come back to. But they're also saying, you know, let's talk a little bit about the structural issues that that women are facing when trying to get into those political spaces, mm -hmm. particularly in terms of women's leadership. So I wondered if you could speak to that and I'll turn over to Farhad as well after that. Yeah, please. And oh, I can't tell you how much I wish that we were in a big conversation. You know, I mean, I would love to hear the ideas of the other people who are listening to these ideas. That, that's my idea of a good time. All right, so 
here's my experience, and I've worked in um, between 40 and 60 war zones. Right. So my experience is that during a conflict, the women who are very, very involved in and absorbed by and uh, can can think of nothing else, and this is why it's important to say it that way. They can think of nothing else but getting clean water for the refugee camp, for stopping the torching and burning down of the homes. 60% was destroyed in Bosnia. For breaking up a rape camp, for all of those things, they're saints. Meanwhile, there is someone or ones who are political leaders, who are the men, and they know that if their side wins, there's going to be not just a prime minister and a president, there's going to be a secretary of the interior or minister of the interior, one for defense, one for foreign affairs, one for agriculture. And people, meaning men, have already lined up for those jobs. And, the, and I go and I talk to the women, you, you care about starvation. You've got to become the secretary of agriculture. And she said, look, look, I'm getting three hours of sleep at night trying to get food to those refugee camps. And I said, yeah, I know, but, but you've got to think ahead and you've got to think of your best and highest use. And you, and you know what? I have a very, very, very hard time getting through that, that idea. And so I think that that's where someone like Mobina Jaffer comes in, who can come in from Canada, but also as a minority woman you know, in the Senate, and she can say, look, to, to the women on the ground, she can say, um, think about that round six in Darfur, in the talks. And the talks were going nowhere, 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 nowhere. And then uh, Senator Jaffer says, wait a minute, I've seen this movie before, right? And we need to bring in some women. And she does. And there's a whole story that goes to that. And the men are arguing about who gets the river. That's the negotiation, who is getting the river and they're not agreeing on that. So they're staying at war and who is, who is suffering, right? But the, the women and the children. And so one of the women says, uh, you, you know that that river doesn't exist. That river dried up a long time ago. Well, how did she know? First of all, it's a very funny story. Right. I mean, I think it's funny if it weren't tragic, but how did she know that? Is it because she has a bigger heart? No. Is it because, I mean, she may have a bigger heart, okay, but that's not why she knew about the river. And is it because um, she is politically savvy? No. It's because she fetches the water. So it's a social role, it's experience that gives her information that is critical to that negotiation. And you can take that example and multiply it by 100,000 in a year because the women bring something to the table. Uh, yes, we know they are superior, sorry, uh, viewers who don't think that, but they're superior at working across aisles. They are superior in terms of intuition. They read body language, but they also make sure that the community concerns, meaning what happened to make the river dry up, those are in the peace agreement. And because of those community concerns that are now in the peace agreement, those peace agreements are much more likely to last. And, you know, peace agreements last for about five years. But if you look at a 20-year mark 
and that will predict stability and that will predict the end of war. They are about 75% more likely to reach that goal if there are women actively involved in that peace agreement in significant ways. And as I said, is it because they're smarter? Uh, no, they are smarter, but never mind, that's not why. And uh, it's, it's because they have different experience that they made sure got put into the peace agreement. That's uh, amazing. I mean, um, I've been part of your Women Waging Peace Network in Pakistan, and you have been supporting a lot of women and peace builders across the world, in fact. And I was part of, as I shared with you, I was there with you in Washington as well. So, um, and seeing all the journey of Women Waging Peace Network concept and then executing and across the world sharing uh, leadership journeys and uh, encouraging women to be the peace leaders. Um, what are your most proud moments among across overall the journey of Women Waging Peace Network? And, what are the disappointments that you have learned from that experience, um, Ambassador? The most proud uh, moment, or one of them, was when we got the US Congress to pass a law saying that the National Action Plan, which is a strategic plan that there are now about, I don't know, 60, 70 countries now that have these plans, they're multi-year, multi-agency, et cetera. These are plans to elevate women. The US Congress said that each year, the people, the organizations that are part of the government who are participating in that plan, so that might be the Department of State, which is our foreign affairs. It might be um, Homeland Security, which most of you know, but, um, they, they look for terrorist organizations, but they also control visas, et cetera. And it might be the Department of Defense, it might be the Treasury, which deals with arms, et cetera. Um, all of those have to, uh, have to report to Congress, to the US Congress about what they're doing to uphold the national plan. And that is structural. And that took years and years. That one was a marathon, not a sprint. And boy, to get something like that passed, that means I was in the offices. And when, when I would do some of the, the lobbying, the advocacy work, um, I was in the offices of the most liberal and of the most conservative and, and of the people who were real big, believers in women and the people who didn't know how to spell women. And, um, you know, I was, we worked and we worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. And when that passed, it was, it was a joy. It was a great joy. Because as you said, um, there, there were, have been a lot of organizations that have been in there making the case. We have had the privilege of working with a lot of those. And so we could be there um, as a coalition, but you know, the fact that I have the word ambassador in front of my, in front of Swanee, it means I can get in to see almost anyone in the U.S. Congress. And that's just reality. I mean, that's thank you, Hillary Clinton, because she's the one who made sure I was ambassador. You're on mute. Okay. What are the challenges that you faced, uh, Ambassador? Because there might be a lot of challenges in Women Waging Peace Network, and of course, a lot of disappointments. Uh, what were those and how you overcome them? Um, right. Well, yeah, for me, it's, it's when we work with the leaders in a country and, and it seems like we're moving forward and for, it might be Israel, Palestine. You know, we had such great women who came to our first year in 1999 when we brought women from 10 different conflict areas. And we wanted to get um, conflicts at different stages, some that were just beginning, some that were in the most dangerous, and some that were healed. 
and we asked Israel and Palestine to come, these delegations, because their conflict was healed. Well, no. And, and so that, that's hard because we've, you know, we've gotten to know these women. We know what it's like back home with all of the, uh, the arms build up and the lack of trust. And, um, and, and so the important thing is to do something that we haven't done, to do it differently. And so to help the Israeli and Palestinian women create um, a, their own um, coalition there between Palestinian and um, and Israelis. And, and that works for a lot of the time. And then things get so bad, so bad that the Palestinians say, we can't be in a coalition with the Israelis because we're being co-opted by the, the Israelis if we do that. And, and, you know, then I and many others, you know, I'm in Israel and then I'm in Ramallah and, and meeting with uh, political leaders, but, you know, often meeting with my students who are, who are the political leaders. And, you know, that's another, that's a great joy to see, um, you know, I have, I think, 800 students roaming around the world. And, and so um, I think that's maybe, that's maybe the, um, the most important to me success is that next generation and the next and the next. And, and I think about Lillian and me under the desk and, and how hard it is that sense of passing it on to the next generation and feeling sometimes like I'm, like, I'm just curled up in a fetal position underneath that desk. And then to say, okay, okay, get a grip, you know, get out, get, get out and get up and you're gonna figure it out. And you've got some really, really helpful people like Farhat and Eileen, and you know there there are a lot of people there to help me stand up again. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, Master, most of the participants of Women Waging Peace Network uh, and across the countries were mostly people who are educated, who knows about peace building or social sciences. The women who are rural, and uh, many of the comments that are coming, of course, they are asking about. I mean, women from the rural backgrounds and their voices, um, especially when you see women from Afghanistan, for example, or women from Yemen or women from Kashmir region, or, you know, people from where, where, where you know, rural women have a very strong place. For example, in Pakistan, for example, we see in Punjab or interior Sin, we see a lot of rural women who are, who are thriving and making their own ways uh, not having these kind of opportunities, but they're, you know, building on, for example, they're building their small and medium enterprises and, and such kind of projects. So what are your thoughts on, 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 uh, for example, people in Africa? I mean, the amazing women we see uh, who had built from scratches and, inter and you know, enterprise it and, you know, let um, some amazing, uh, within the communities, built empowerment of their own so what, do, what are your thoughts on that, on building such kind of projects and supporting them as well? Right, right. Well, I was in Liberia uh, with my friend, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who now had been become president. And uh, I asked her, what can I do that would be the most helpful? You need everything. You know, you've been through a 14 year war. You need everything. You need electricity, you need running water you need, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And she said, you know, I'll be able to find international help for that. I want you to do what other people don't do, which is I want you to work with my women leaders. So that's part of it is to believe that if you get the right people in the power positions who have the sensitivity for the women who are in the rural areas, 
that's that's just one way that's one way to go about it um, but it's the way that that I tend to think and and then I'm in uh, Rwanda and as you know I wrote a book Rwandan Women Rising and I was there for 17 years in and out in and out and I saw how the women became 64% of the parliament and half the president's cabinet and half the Supreme Court. And they did it with this grassroots push up from the bottom and, and then a pull from the top from the president. And that's how they got themselves into 30% of the parliament. And they were so good at it that then the women in that 30% said, you know what, I have name recognition. I know a lot about this country. The country knows me. I'm going to run against the men. And I'm going to let my sisters have one of the seats that are set aside. And that's how they became 64%. But the women who were in that push up from the bottom, they couldn't read or write. You know, in fact, when they were at home, if there were men present in their home other than family, they couldn't speak. It was taboo. And then there was this chaos of this genocide and the chaos, here's the irony, the chaos cracked open the culture. And now you had this vacuum and the women rushed into that breach. They surged into the breach. And it, it's the most remarkable story how that happened. And then they, and they created their own women's village councils because they couldn't speak if they were at home. But in a women's council, that's all it was, was women speaking. And there were thousands and thousands and thousands of these. And then they voted to the next level and the next level. By the time they got to the top, they had run for office five times. And then they were ready to go and be in those set aside seats. And, you know, it was, you know, in, in Liberia, on the other side of, of the continent, in Africa, it was the market women. It was the women who had their big baskets and they were selling spices or fish or whatever they were selling in the market. They are the ones who are credited with electing Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. And one of the, when I've been there, one of the stories told to me is that the women who had the education, they would go and sit by the baskets in the market and carry on the business while the market women would go and vote. And I, I mean, I can hardly tell that story without wanting to cry. It's just, you see how, and that's in a completely indigenous model that you would never, you would never even write up and take to another country and say, why don't you do it this way? You know, I mean, we certainly would write up and say, why don't you have a loan project and get 10 of you and everyone has your small business and, and no one gets any more. Um, funding until all of the different loans are paid back. I mean, and that's a great model, but who knows what indigenous models, what other ones are. And Eileen, I hope that you are cataloging this kind of thing. You know, we, we ought to have a thousand of those examples written up. I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, the question is, even as we're busy women trying to do all the work, how do we get to get to a place where we're more effectively capturing that information? I think, you know, the work that you did on your book, for example, um, Rabuan and Women Rising, um, the great thing about that is that it's re elevating women's stories, their own stories with their name on it. And I think that's, uh, that's something we want to continue to ensure happens. Um, I want to come back to some of the comments and, and the feedback, um, but, um, and maybe ask it in a broader question. Um, we've had been, you know, both Farhat and I in our respective parts of the world and our organizations, we, we've been having a lot of conversations recently with um, our peers, our partners, our graduates, um, 
who are living in, in protracted conflict zones. Um, you know, some of them you've already uh, indicated. Um, I know colleagues right now working in Yemen, Cameroon, these women on the front lines, they're exceptional. They're not only providing frontline services, but they're also advocating for peace and they're trying to push their own leadership agenda forward. They're trying to they're build their own leadership capacity. And now on top of it, we have a pandemic, um, which is complicating everything again. So, I mean, how do you see the work, the work that we need to be doing on, on particularly for women peace builders and women's leadership in peace building, how do you see it shifting now with all this extra complexity that we have with crisis and conflict and, you know, and pandemic? And what does, what do we need as an international community, especially need to think about and consider with programs and projects that we are, we are undertaking? Right. Well, I, I can say a couple of things, but it won't be at the programs and projects level, but I would very, very much like to hear and read about your work as you've been considering that. Um, one is that uh, description of the women who uh, are heading up countries that are the most successful in dealing with the, the pandemic they are way disproportionately women, women-led. And so the question becomes, why? And um, do you want, I may have, I may have the, I may be able to rattle off, yeah. <clears throat> they are Denmark, Norway, Finland, Iceland, New Zealand, Taiwan and Germany. And their leadership is saving millions of lives. And um, what is it about what they're doing? And one is, uh, it's about leadership qualities. And if you look at you know, whether or not they are more careful or not, or you know if they are more oriented toward safety rather than, oh, than pushing the economy, et cetera, in, the, in any given moment. Those all count. But the other thing that counts in a huge way and is difficult to measure, and that is humility. And that is the flip side to what I was saying about women not being confident enough when Hillary Clinton interviews them. And it's that lack of, uh, it's a lack of overconfidence. Obviously, they're confident enough to become president of their country, right? But once they get there, they don't have the sense of, I have the answers. And that's the key. Do they think they have the answers? Because you know what? They don't. They don't have the answers because you know why? Nobody does. And so what we can do as an international community is find ways to collaborate, to collaborate, to collaborate. And again, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, when Ebola hit Liberia, first thing she did was figure out what's a regional plan here. Liberia can't do this by ourselves. What is the regional plan? And how do we get the attention of the international community? Mm, really good points. You know, um, the work that we do at uh, Cody Institute, um, and uh, it has really been um, driven towards ensuring that what we are, uh, what our work is, is the accompaniment of citizen leaders, of advancing citizen-led community-driven development. And recognizing that, as you said, we don't have all the answers, but what we do have is the ability to support and to help and to you know, elevate voices, particularly voices of women leaders. Um, so you know, understanding and appreciating, as you've said, um, the expertise that already exists on the ground and, and going in with humility is, is absolutely essential. Um, so we've, we've gotten a lot of comments, Farhat, I'm gonna, go through some of them. And if you point out a few, um, 
we're down to our last 15 minutes with Ambassador Hunt, and I'm just thinking about the richness of what we are seeing here in terms of the, of the comments. And I want to say that at Cody and with the IPDS, we're committed to putting all this information together and sharing it with everybody with along with the recording. Um, but I will just, if I could, um, colleagues have been telling me some of the key ones that they've been pointing out. There's one person that wrote, there are women who need help and women who can help. There are women who lead and there are women who need. Uh, women who can lead are struggling specifically in pol political decision-making spaces. And women are demanding for their participation, not asking for rights, but for their roles and responsibilities too. Women are ready to lead. They just need the space and the attention to listen to their perspective, opinion, and solution. The world is in need of change. And for this women's perspective, approaches and leadership is so important. I think that's the kind of message I think we can really get behind. And, you know, others, you know, coming back to a comment you made earlier, um, right from the beginning is about male champions and, and looking for ways in which we, we also, um, uh, we also uh, indicate as women how these how men can support us, not to take away our voice, but also to look at ways in which they can also be responsibly adding. So these are the some of the things that are coming up. There's also some very specific comments that are coming from particular conflict affected countries and, and women that are working there. Farhat, is there anything that you're seeing that you want to also add on in comments? Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of uh, wonderful comments that are coming from different parts of the world. There are people who are asking about specifically focusing on COVID crisis and how women are, you know, dealing with all these challenges, uh, especially uh, with, with all the, um, you know, increased challenge. I think that it has it has put them on a, on spot more as, as compared to what they were facing before. Um, and then, you know, a lot of questions are asking about um, your own um, leadership journey from now onwards to uh, what are what are your plans and few of the questions that are coming I mean there are a lot of phenomenal um, women leaders who are at the table you know around us as well and there are, I mean you can share about your I mean these voices how do you see these voices being amplified from from this place to from now to onwards when we are facing this COVID crisis? Um, and especially when you when you're writing those and documenting all those voices, specifically uh, recently published your book on Rwanda Woman Rising, where you had also documented and you had interviewed a lot of uh, women from that ground. Um, and you're, then you, you write those uh, stories, you document those stories and you share with all the, all the world of those stories. So, one question is that where you will taking those stories forward from now to to far, where we see as future. And then what is the motivation behind writing and documenting those stories? How important is it for you to document and you know share? Uh, may I, as happened so often, may I start with the last one? Okay, so. <laughs> Do that. Okay. Okay. So, okay, so I'm, I'm sitting at the dinner table and uh, it's my husband and my son who's about 10 years old. And so I'm writing a book on Bosnia and it's called, This Was Not Our War. And which is a quote that one of the 26 women that I interviewed for seven years, that was her comment. And, and he said, Mom, you couldn't go to a movie with us tonight. I said, yeah, I know, I'm working on my book. And he said, yeah, but, but why are you working on this book? Who's gonna buy this book? I thought, well, it's a good question. I said, you know, Teddy, maybe nobody. And then he felt sorry for me. So he said, mom, listen, someday someone's going to write the history of that war and they're going to go to a library <laughs> and they're going to go up a ladder and they're going to find your book <laughs> on the top of this shelf and they're going to bring it down and it'll become part of history. Now, I have remembered that for you know, 25 years and, and that's how it is. In fact, that is how it is, that it's critically important 
that we write these stories for the sake of history because women will be written out of history and history becomes the story of men killing other men, right? Um, but the other piece is when I wrote that particular book, the women whom I was talking with for all those years and with a video camera, uh, they were wealthy and they were poor and they were atheist and they were Muslim and they were Roman Catholic and they were Orthodox Catholic and they were non-believers, you know, and they were as different people as I could possibly find. And so they would tell me stories and I never said, tell me a story about how you reached across the line. Did not. All I said was, tell me what happened, period. And they would start talking about the war and that's when one of them said, this was not our war, et cetera. But I said, well, what was life like for you before the war? And so a woman says, uh, well, I remember my daughter going to church and how, how cute she looked in her white dress because she was going for first communion. And so now I know mm -hmm. it's the Roman Catholic. Okay, so that's a little bit of information for me. And she said, and a lot of her friends and their families came. I said, okay. And then they came over to our home and I made sure Oh, I said like, well, what did you have to eat? And, and she said, well, I made sure that we didn't have any pork so that our friends would be able to have something to eat. Now, now I know that we have Roman Catholic with Muslim. And those stories over and over and over explain to me why they would say this is not an ethnic war this is not a religious war. It was a power grab by a despicable political leader who then ended up accused and of being a war criminal and he died before he was convicted. But, you know, Slobodan Milosevic. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, all of us on the outside in the media, radio, print, Etc. we were all writing about how this is a religious war. And if it's a religious war, you know what? People don't want to get involved in trying to stop it because religious wars, you get this feeling, oh, geez, you know, there's no right, there's no wrong. Everyone says God's on their side. And so that was part of the ploy of Milosevic to put it out that it's a religious war. So you had to have the stories of everyday life. And that's what the women were able to tell. These were the stories and we didn't have ham so that our daughter's friends could come to the house and eat. Mm. Yeah. You asked a lot of great questions there. It, we, we could even easily take another session with you, I think. I, I did want to flag a, a comment um, uh, and you know that I think is really important and here here in Canada but also in the US of course um, you know we are we are living as settlers on indigenous in, on indigenous lands and one of the comments that came up um, you know through our Facebook live session also was um, from a woman leader it's a matrilineal society in northern British Columbia so on the west coast of Canada so, and it's the Gitsan First Nations. And, you know, she said it's really interesting and it's complicated. She's been listening in because, you know, they're being governed by a government, they're governed by a government system that is against the values and traditions of, of people. So, so of, of their people in particular and, and the systems don't work for us. So I think as women leaders, when we're thinking about, you know, peace and conflict, you know, uh, I would encourage us to be thinking, you know, more broadly around peace and conflict, but also um, you know, our work, our important work as women leaders in dismantling systems that also don't work for, for people that contribute to what you said earlier, which is, this was not our war. This mm -hmm. is not what we asked for. So right. that's the kind of feedback that we're, we're getting, I think. And there's so many others. And as I said, um, for those that are listening today, um, we're down to our last question with, with Ambassador Hunt because we're running out of time. But 
I'm tracking all of the information that you've sent in and we're going to be sharing that with Ambassador Hunt as well as sharing it with all of you in uh, following the, the session today. So Farhat, the last question for Ambassador Hunt, who's been very generous with her time. Yes, exactly, Eileen. And I'm so overwhelmed and happy that today Ambassador Hunt had, you know, very candidly share her own journey over the time, you know, over the times. Um, Ambassador Hunt, you wrote, I mean, wonderful books. And the last question would definitely be asking you to, to, to read some of the extract from the book from a part that you really want to share. And then considering those stories and the impact and the words that you use in those stories um these are the lessons right and these are the lessons that you want to share with the world so this is not so you know but those lessons are not just for only for i mean only for the peace building but also for the state building so what are the lessons that you really want to share with women who are there growing in front of us as leaders and what are the lessons that you really want to share with them who are on the path towards the journey as myself, as I'm mentored by Eileen, I'm in the middle. I'm not Ambassador Hunt and I'm not Eileen. So I'm just in the middle. So what are the lessons that you would like to share with those who are just in the middle and reaching to the positions that we really want? Uh, well, I don't have something to read to you, but I do want to critique you since I'm a teacher. There is no such thing as just in the middle. You're, you're not just- I couldn't agree middle. more with you. Thank you. I said that to her already before. We're too humble. <laughs> and everybody listen to your language. Maybe that's what I want to say. And help each other listen to your language. And next time you hear, well, I don't know if this makes sense, but blah, 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 blah. Stop yourself or stop your friend. What, uh, why are you saying? I mean, if you don't know it makes sense, then don't say it. I don't want to hear it. Don't take my time. You know, don't start with, I don't know if this makes sense. Just say it. Or you say, well, this could be crazy, but you know what? If you think it could be crazy, don't take my time. Just put it out there. Just put out your idea and see what happens. And our no one is just in the middle. Uh, I try this one on. I'm just a mother. You know, I'm sitting here, or, or um, I'm just, uh, I only made it to primary school. Yeah, all the ways we take away our power. And that's different from somebody else taking it away, right? I think they're connected. I think we, feel powerless often because we've had so much power in the system that has been since we that we've not experienced. But oh that means I'm supposed to take my mid my <laughs> midday medicine. So maybe we should Wow um, that's that sounds <laughs> the music couldn't have been timed any better, <laughs> Ambassador Hunt. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and and thank you for those final comments because I think uh, again I will just reiterate um, what you've said about women. Women, you know, I I have an allergy, for example, to the word emerging, emerging oh. leader. My colleagues who are on the line know this. We we sometimes talk about youth leaders or we talk about young women as emerging leaders, and to me, there's no such thing. You are a leader. Um, it's not something you're born with it, uh, necessarily, although people have many traits that they might bring to the table. There's leadership in, in, in so many women all among, all around us, whether it's political or other spaces. So um, I'm going to say so much, uh, thank you very, very much for joining us today. Um, as we've said earlier, we could have done, you know, two, maybe three different sessions. There's so much that we could unpack the questions that have been coming in, the the, the insights that have been shared also, the, the expertise that's been shared in our chat function um, is quite tremendous. Um, so on behalf of Farhat and myself and Farhat, thank you so much for all the work you've done. And you know my colleagues at the Cody Institute as well. And to your colleagues, um, uh, Ambassador Hunt at the Inclusive Security and at the, at the Harvard School, 
Thank you so much for your time today. And we look forward to continuing a conversation with you um, in, the, in, the, in the months to come. So thank you so much. Sure. And, and yes, thank you to the viewers. And we will find a way somehow for us to get together again. Yeah. Eileen, you must share about the upcoming conference there in, uh, in the Cody. You must share about that. Thank well. you so much. Every, thank you, Farhad. You're advertising for me. So Cody Institute, um, working with community leaders all around the world. One thing I will say is that my colleagues in the International Center for Women's Leadership here at Cody Institute at the university are putting together the plans right now for a, a, an online virtual women, peace and security conference that will be taking place in the fall and we'll be really excited to share more information with everybody that's taken part today, including Ambassador Hunt. Um, yeah. And the, the intent of that, that conference will really, again, to be um, to rise up women's voices um, around the world, working at the grassroots and ensure that they are given the same amount of attention as any of us that are more privileged in our positions would get and, and have a lively conversation about the 20th anniversary in particular of 1325. UN Resolution 1325. So stay tuned. Thanks, Farhat. And thanks, everybody, again. Thank this concludes our session. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Love Hunt. It. Thank you so much, Eileen. And thank you, so colleagues in the Hunt, and, you know, inclusive security as well. Thank you, Eileen, for, for you know, supporting me. And, you know, um, and ladies and gentlemen who are with us uh, for this special exclusive episode of Global Woman Insight that I started. It's just... Uh, just the beginning. We are just giving voices to the um, and spotlighting women leaders as Ambassador Hunt, so that we can sit around them with them and learn from them, and you know share their insights and how we can all navigate through all the challenges that we are facing as leaders. Thank you so much, both of you, and thank you so much, everyone from across the world who had joined us today. Good night, everyone from Pakistan. Good night. Good afternoon from from Canada. Thank you.